Barney, thank you for joining us. We're very excited to ask a few questions about what you're doing at Cambridge and the initiative. Perhaps, Barney, you can tell us a little bit about you and, and your role at the University of Cambridge. Yeah, sure thing. Well, in April, I will have been there for 15 years working through various different roles. And really, I need to be a sort of focal point for technology projects and communications projects and where they, where they mm -hmm. intersect. And crucially, at the moment, that means looking at over 3,200 websites and working out how can we make them represent the best of what the university is doing, mm. make them accessible for everybody, make them look great, make them easy to maintain uh, in an institution or actually hundreds of institutions mm. that up until now have kind of been looking after things in different ways. So how can I bring them all together? So okay. my role is to try and make those various different communities share best practice, mm. look at the technology we're using, seeing how we can make better use of that. Okay. But also look at how we can communicate and engage with people through digital channels. Yeah. Now, principally the web rather than social media for, for the mm. role that I'm involved with. So I guess in the last 15 years, you've seen your role in the institution change in the ways yeah. that you communicate with your audience. Yeah. Can you maybe highlight kind of some of those macro changes and some big milestones in those Yeah, in that yeah, time sure. That's... So very early on, I suppose, and it still is the case now, a lot of the emphasis is on widening participation and how can we carry the kind of history of the university, mm. but make people feel that it's something that they can be part of. Mm. Even if, say, they're coming from a family that has never had anybody go to university before, for example. Okay. And so back in 2008, when I started, it seemed like there was an opportunity through social media to affect that kind of engagement mm. and that feeling of the brand in a more effective way with younger audiences than through our websites. Mm. So seeing social media as perhaps the front door, more so than our website, was one of those shifts. Mm. And then not long after that, just looking at the way that the amount of traffic we were getting from people that were using smartphones or tablets rather than desktop computers, looking at the way we laid out information and the way we presented it in a way that it could be responsive, that was probably the next, the next point. Right, yeah. Um, and fast forwarding to where we are now, which is most of our sites are fine for responsive and they're fairly accessible. Mm. But we have to try and in a way, I think with the way we engage with people through our websites, we almost need to now catch up with what we've been able to do with social media, which is to be a lot more kind of fast moving and authentic okay. with the voices. Whereas a lot of our web content, a lot of the copy needs a bit more of a refresh, really. Mm. And we're talking about over 2 million web pages. So it's a, it's a fair, fair bit of work to be done. Right. Um, so, yeah, I guess imagine the, the web and that medium just lends itself to be a bit more static and can go a bit, a bit more stale, but you don't have that not necessarily luxury with social, but you've got to have a, yeah. a lot more temperance to it. What are some of the challenges that you face today that potentially weren't on the radar sort of 15 years ago when you, when you first joined? Well, probably the size of the digital estate because we may have had a few hundred websites mm. back in 2008, and now we have thousands of them. So that, that's one challenge. And the fact that some of that content will be copies of other content. So we've got duplication, which means that understandably, a lot of the route into our online information is through search engines, yeah. which I guess was the case back in 2008 as well. But because we've been building up this legacy of, in some cases, duplicate content or stale content, mm the search engines are understandably starting to downrank our own mm. voices. So as an institution, in some cases, we might be competing with ourselves, where we've got two different bits of the institution talking about the same topic. Mm. And the search engine can't work out which is the definitive voice on that mm. particular subject. So that, that's one of the challenges, is that right. we've got lots of very bright people. And through the way that the university's sort of been built up over the years, it is a kind of a devolved institution. Mm. They're all creating content in their own way. So I suppose the challenge is trying to change people's feelings and ideas about mm. how can they be free to write whatever they want for their websites, but how can they also think about what their partner institutions are doing within the university and try and work as a cohesive whole rather than competing with each other unwittingly. Mm. So you had social, the rise of mobile. Where do you see it going? What kind of things do you see uh, evolving over the next sort of few years in the higher education sector that you could see as the big next macro issue? 
Well, I mean, I sort of see where we are at. I imagine many other institutions got to where we were many years ago, but perhaps didn't have as much devolution. I think trying to get centralised sources of information is probably going to be more and more important. Mm. People can draw on central information, make it easy to edit. I'd be interested to see with social media whether the channels continue to behave in such a way that audiences are kept within that channel rather than seeing that channel as a jumping off point to a web page, for example. Okay. I think mm. I think kind of auditing content and being able to analyze things and keep them up to date is always going to be a challenge. So I can just kind of see the challenge of managing content to continue to be as complicated it is as it is at the moment mm. and to be a, a big challenge. I'd be interested to see how much AI plays a part in helping with some of that. In what sense do you see AI helping with content governance? Well, I would love to be able to throw 2.1 million pages at something. Yeah. And for it to spit out a report saying, here are your highest reputational risks right now, based mm. on how audiences are interacting with this particular type of content, how it links to your institutional goals, the number of times it's being read, and the last time it was even edited, which might have been like five or six years ago. Yeah. Because we essentially, with the number of pages and sites that we've got, we just need a really succinct way of triaging which of the sites we deal with first. Mm. And ultimately, we want to reduce the number of sites that we've got. Yeah. OK. Um, I imagine that's a challenge that governments and big universities yeah. Yeah, are facing here, is how do you get that bird's eye view, but add that kind of intelligence to that reporting that mm. doesn't just go on, like show you the basics of the metadata yeah. within them. Oh, I'd love now to move on to um, this digital presence project that you're, that you're running. Could you tell us a little bit about it and kind of specifically maybe frame it as so what happened inside the organization to, to kickstart the initiative? Sure thing. Well, a few years back, we hired our first dedicated user experience researchers. And I was lucky to be able to have a chat with them and they were interested to know what had our challenges been up until that point with managing websites online? What mm. were the aspirations for the institution with our websites? Where were we kind of falling short? And the general feeling was that when we went responsive, there was only a number of websites we were able to get into the new templates at the time. Mm. And we never really dealt with some of the bigger, knotty issues, like, for example, information architecture. Okay. We did quite a good job of creating responsive templates, making them look more contemporary at the time. Mm. But we hadn't had enough time or resources to really think about what kind of structure could you add to a website that could work across all these different institutions? Mm. So there was a review of our sites. There were various interviews with content editors, also with mm. six formers who were trying to apply to study here. And it kind of summarized all the problems from a, from a fresh perspective that we had. And they kind of highlighted the point that there's no point creating new web templates to improve a website. You need to think about the whole life cycle of content from the way it's created, why it's being created, Right. how audiences are interacting with it. And from that, we had a digital strategy that we co-wrote with Kate Livingston, who's a user researcher or, or at the time was the head of user research. And now she's mm. leading digital transformation for the university. Okay. The strategy said, well, here's where we should be heading. And this is the kind of implementation plan you'd need to do that, mm. which we then got the funding for, which is the digital presence program. And that's essentially looking at how can you create intranets and a new way of creating websites with a upskilled team of people across the university mm. so that we've got something that we can look after in-house okay. for subsequent years. Not having to do a sort of massive refresh every six years or so, but switch to a more iterative update mm. cycle. Okay. So that, that's the idea behind that. Mm. Big initiative. Um, uh, lots of stakeholders. Could you talk me through how you phased it out? Like what's your... Where, where did you go first? And Sure thing. Well, so we, we spent a year just kind of doing a lot of fact finding, really, yeah. and trying to work out what were the knottiest problems that needed sorting out. Mm. And because for many of our audiences, their user journey goes through 
many of our websites. So if you're a sixth former, you might look at a departmental website, yeah. you might look at the admissions website, and you might look at a college website. Because as an undergraduate, if you apply to study at Cambridge, you apply for your course, but you also apply to one of our 31 colleges. Right. And so the user experience of that means you're going to get bounced across quite a few sites. Mm. As that's one of the things we want to deal with first, we thought, okay, well, let's take a single user journey and try and improve that rather than improve one particular website. So the first thing we're going to look at is the undergraduate applicant journey yeah. and those digital touch points across those various sites and how we can improve that through improved design mm. and analytics and improving the copy. So we're going to deal with that first and then we're going to deal with other journeys that, again, we're going to prioritise. Mm. Okay. Yes, you, you, you touch on an, an interesting thing that I think Cambridge has fairly unique in this sense, or several other universities in the UK and, and several abroad have in the sense that you're effectively your own mini city. You know, you've yeah. got every department has their own communications channel. Uh, you just talked about the admissions process there with multiple steps managed by different departments. Um, like, sounds like that, that process and just that whole setup creates information silos. Um, how, how do you think it affects the, the visitor's experience? I would say at the moment online, the experience can be any manner of things depending on which particular subject you're mm. applying for. And some of our departments will have dedicated communications people. And other departments, they may have somebody that has communications within their role. Mm. But that, that person's also dealing with a whole bunch of other issues in that department. Okay. So it isn't a sort of equal spread of resources for, for each department. Mm. So I think we are trying to make it level for everybody, okay. the departments and the people applying for those topics, mm. by hopefully being able to provide central support for updating content. So are you the, is your department like the catch-all then? Like when departments can't write their own copy or people get lost, they'll come to, to you for assistance. So I was wondering how this has affected your team. So up until now, departments wouldn't have had a definitive place to go to for that kind of support. Mm. They might have traditionally been able to go to a web developer for problems with the content management system. Yeah. But for copywriting, a lot of it would have been to best endeavors. And in a way, one of the deliveries of the digital presence program, as well as you know, a great supported way of building intranets yeah. and a great supported way of building websites, yeah. is to also have that team. In, in a sense, that team doesn't exist yet. Okay. And that, that was one of the things we also identified in the report. People need a one-stop place they can go to for all that kind of advice. And, and actually, one of the things we found, and we still find it to this day, actually, is people will come to us and say, can we have a new website? And then now we've started digging into what are they trying to achieve? And in many cases, they might not need a website, they might need an event, or they might need a few web pages on an existing mm. website. Okay. So we have to try and challenge that idea that a dedicated separate website is a solution for something. I think sometimes it's a kind of knee jerk response that people think that's what they need, mm. which is understandable because they haven't been given that advice before. Right. So. I think in time our team will be a catch-all. Yeah. At the moment, it's a case in the university that you've, certain individuals will get a reputation for, for understanding particular areas of expertise, and then they will be kind of emailed directly with responses mm. or, or questions about these sorts of things. And then we can't even track, for example, how many people are asking for websites every week. Okay, it doesn't come into any central logging or ticketing so systems. Or now it does. So the other thing we've done in the program in the first year is to start to direct all those queries from that. We tried to find those kind of superstars that the people yeah. that people go to all the time and, and not try and ask them to be less helpful, but just say, look, can you just try and funnel people through a logging system? Yeah. Because then at least we can work out the size of this problem. Which is how big. I was going to say, yeah, <laughs> that was my next question. How big, how many of those? Um... There's, there's probably about probably about three or four new website requests a week, I would say. Okay. So, yeah, not Which given that we've got 3,200 already. Yeah. And each one of those requests is fairly unique and needs to be dealt with quite carefully. Yeah. And, you know, we have finite developer resource. And, and in, in many cases, and I'm sure this is the case for many other institutions, the same team that's trying to look after the business as usual are also trying to develop the next version yeah. of our platform 
And so it's weighing up how do you look after today whilst also trying to develop tomorrow. Mm. And that's, that's quite a challenge. I suppose that has to, when you're setting out your timeline and phases, be realistic to how much you can achieve in Absolutely. various years and yeah. extend out the process. Yeah. Mm. I think you touched on it a little bit earlier, but you talked a little bit about user journey mapping. Um, could you maybe help the audience understand, like, what does that look like for, for your department and, and maybe lay out some of the activities that, that went there? Yeah, sure. So it, it would actually be the, the user researchers in university information services. They, okay. they have the real expertise to mm. physically create journey maps, which are extraordinary things that might fill up, you know, several. You might you may need five rooms of this size to just print something out and put it across the wall. Yeah. And it would show a persona. So, you know, a, 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 an anonymous fake photograph of a person. Probably could that could be generated by yeah, AI. Yeah, now. yeah, yeah. Create me a member of the public, that kind of thing. And in this case, it would be a sixth form, right? Who might be interested mm. in studying history. They might be the first person to go to uni in their family or whatever. And we try to map out all, what are all the points that that person has to go to, either physically or virtually, in order to apply to study. You know, what mm. are the forms that they have to fill out? Um, how long do they spend doing these various different tasks? Mm. And to get that information, it might mean contacting six forms around the country and seeing if we can find volunteers yeah. to either kind of shadow them during that process, interview them, uh, look at statistics to see where do people fall off on particular parts of that journey, mm. and just try and understand where are all the data sources that inform that journey. What do we consider a success criteria as, as that person proceeds? And I imagine you found some gaps in that process. Yeah, yeah, lots of gaps. Yeah, um, and a lot of it is to do with, I suppose, digitization, where you might take a somebody in any institution may have a, a fairly long paper form, for example. Yeah, and they see they see it as a transformative step to take that as is form and put it online, when really they should be thinking what are the questions we absolutely have to ask now? Yeah. And how can we use digital tools to make that as simple as possible? And if you just kind of lift and shift something from the analog environment into the digital environment, you're sort of losing mm. the point of that new ecosystem. I think a big case is that of like online campus maps, I think right. you're trying to replicate the physical world on the digital world, but it yeah. doesn't necessarily give that protective student a real understanding about the institution and what it's like, you know, maybe that's an opportunity to, yeah, absolutely. to really look at it. That department who did the user journey mapping came up with some great insights. Yeah. Which one have you decided to go for first to, to work on? The undergraduate application journey, that that's is the, the main one to go for first, mm -hmm. mainly because so many of our websites look and behave differently. If we've got a really bright six former out there that maybe they've had the support to make them realize that they are bright enough to come to the university. Mm. And there are so many kids out there that are, but they might not identify as being the right kind of person to come to the Cambridge, but they absolutely are. If they then come to a website which alienates them because mm. of the way it's written, or the fact that if they have to go to three websites to complete their application, they might get confused because website number two behaves in a different way to website number one. Mm. If we lose a great candidate because of the way our websites are constructed, that's ridiculous. So mm. we have to stop losing great candidates because of the way our websites yeah. are produced. Okay. So it seems like an obvious one to go for first. Yeah. And and that narrative of trying to get the best to come to, to Cambridge or those that, that you know uh, that have the means to, to do it, was that a driving factor when you went across these different departments to get buy-in for this? For this initiative, um, was it? Did you put that as the north star about this is the reason we're doing it? And did people sort of engage with that, or was there a little bit of pushback? No, they they did engage with that, and there wasn't pushback at all, really. Um, I think I think that was was very compelling for people, as was the search engine side of things, where we could show departments the experience of a member of the public searching for their particular topic area mm. and showing them what shows up on popular search engines, okay. which might have shown that their department maybe was on the third or fourth page. And then making them understand that one of the reasons for that was the fact that maybe their copy wasn't up to date or they had multiple pages saying the same thing. 
that's been really useful, again, going back to having an evidence base behind why yeah. we're doing things. We can sort of very clearly show that past behavior unwittingly has created an environment where we're competing against ourselves as an institution. Mm. I think user-centric gets thrown around a lot, but you've taken sure. a user-centered design approach there by obtaining buy-in, by showing them this is the experience that very much so. the very fragmented or friction, frictionful experience that they're yeah. getting right now to try and change that. I, I guess another good example of what can you show people to bring them around, I mean, where we've been able to have video interviews of, of six formers where we've got all mm. the consent and things like that. And as with most kind of user tests like that, you know, where you're getting the participant to verbalize what they're looking at, why they're clicking on particular things and what they're feeling at that mm. point. When you've got a recording of someone saying, I don't understand where to go now, um, I'm interested in this particular subject, but maybe Cambridge has a different title for that subject. Right. And when you can show heads of institutions, just recordings of people actually getting lost. Mm. It is very compelling and you can't really argue with that. I mean, we're not going to, we haven't got the resources to fake footage like that. It's, yeah. just, <laughs> it's just legitimately the case. Um, I think there's the, is it Nielsen Norman, the UX group, they did a study and this is um, systemic across all of higher education. And he was about, um, they did a user survey of several hundred students and 48% of students didn't realize a university offered the course, sure. even when it did, yeah. because uh, the information about that course was hidden in various mega menus or there wasn't, it wasn't clearly signposts that this is where you can access. So yeah. a student was like, oh, well, maybe this school doesn't do what I'm looking for. And they just leave the site and, and go elsewhere, um, which seems like a huge waste of resources. You sure. get everyone to the, the front door, so to speak, and then they get at the final hurdle. They just don't even bother applying. So with that in mind, then, do, have you changed the content governance or workflows of some of these departments and how they publish content? Not yet. The first thing we've done is create a community of practice. Okay. And, you know, many universities have done great examples of this, where you bring together a virtual at the time, because it was kind of during the pandemic that we really increased the idea on communities mm. of practice. You bring like-minded professional people together around any particular topic area. And for us, it was around content. So we had a content community of practice. Okay. And through that, we were explaining to people things like search engine optimization, writing for the web, accessibility, mm. uh, optimizing the uses of images online, things like that. Okay. So rather than saying you have to do things like this, we were trying to bring those groups of people, in some cases in their hundreds together, to show them what best practice looked like. Mm. And then as a network, they were kind of sharing good examples with each other and helping each other out. That, that's been the kind of more softly, softly approach we've been able to take. The next step would be how can we embed it into people's job descriptions and make it fair for those concerned so yeah. that departments know who other people are within that department that's responsible for editing content. And if that person is supposed to be doing that, and they need to be given the time to access training, which we can provide on how to do a good job of mm. it. Uh, did anything surprise you from bringing those people together? Were you surprised by the digital literacy of the quote unquote web editors across campus? So I'd say that many of them instinctively are good writers, but the shift to writing for the web for some of them was harder than others. Mm. They're incredibly passionate about trying to engage with the audiences that their respective departments are trying to engage with. Mm. They saw through the training what it was they needed to improve the way that they were creating content. But the thing that surprised us was just the absolute lack of time that they have to use those new skills. So I suppose that's a scary thing. And again, it probably isn't unusual for other institutions, but where we have this decentralized approach, it isn't consistent across the institution which departments have got enough mm. person hours to devote to improving content, yeah. for example. Um, and I suppose with any learning, it's you know, your, our memories are fairly short-sighted, isn't it? So yeah. then uh, you may remember for the first three or four, five months, but then if you don't publish any content for half a year, yeah. and come back to it then. That's is that another issue then that you, you're seeing in the, on the horizon? Maybe digital presence is done in a year, two years time, and then bad habits start to creep back or is it? I think, I think the next step is, I would say at the web editor role, 
at that, that level with the, the institution, everybody that we've met, and there's probably, there could be six, 700 people around the university that you could say are web editors, maybe even more than that. They absolutely get, get it. They understand what would make their content that they own better. Okay. The next step is to report that to the heads of those various institutions. So we're working on a dashboard at the moment which we want to pull from as many data sources as possible. Mm. So we could go to, and we have several hundred institutions within the university. So we could go to one of the heads of those institutions and present them with a, a dynamic report that at any given time would say, here's how many websites you've got, here's how they're performing, here's how many people you've got editing them, mm. editing them, so that you can, they can clearly make business decisions. It's easier for them to see that they may have a reputational risk. They realize that they've got a lot of content and they don't have anybody to edit it. Yeah. And hopefully we can bring them around to the idea that they need to resource more kind of dedicated roles in that area in order to continue to get the students that they want to get, mm. get the postgraduates they want, get the research collaborations that they want. Is that a carrot to get people onto on board onto the digital presence infrastructure as well? I imagine so. They come Absolutely. on, yeah. they'll use your website or intranet uh, building facility, and then they'll get this usage dashboard yeah, and the business, exactly. the business side will get that. Yeah. Okay. I mean, accessibility would be another point. So, I mean, we're working to web content accessibility guidelines, 2.1 AA compliance at the moment. Yeah. But then the next version of that will be out fairly soon. And, and so... I th yeah, to, yeah, this year, I think. Exactly. Yeah. So... You know, we're, we're catching up to bring our existing sites as much as possible up to those standards, and they're, they're kind of there now. But mm. it's not a, that is not just a problem for the templates or the content management system. That's a problem for anybody that writes content or uploads images or, in worst cases, PDFs for, <laughs> for their sites. Yeah. So that's a live thing that needs looking after every day, really. And... We need to get the institution to realize that there isn't a way of fixing something at a point in time and it stays fixed. It needs constant nurturing. Yeah. And oftentimes I was talking to a university up in Scotland and um, even if their web team found some inaccessible pages and went to that department and said, this isn't accessible. It's not like, and they should change that. Oh, well, you know, it's contrast and yeah, we'll get to it. And even the social good doesn't necessarily change, but then, but then an audit came and it's a, you know, a directive from the government and then suddenly everyone's uh, up and sure. arms and making changes. And yeah. um, there's interesting about behavior about in that story. But uh, has, I imagine as Cambridge, have you been at the sharp end of the legislation to have accessible sites? So we, we volunteer uh, the public sector accessibility legislation we voluntarily meet those criteria, even though as an institution, we're technically not mandated, held up, to. Yeah, mandated to. But we just think it's the obvious thing to do. Why would we not be accessible to as many people as possible? Yeah. So we do take that side of things very seriously. And I, I see it as, as attached very much to widening participation in that if we have the aspirations to be open to everybody, then accessibility is an obvious part of that. Yeah. And we have, as, as well as having people that obviously want to do that. We also have researchers in inclusive design and things like that that also work on digital presence. So in some cases, they might look at web content accessibility guidelines and try and work out if there are ways of pushing them even further mm. or you know, questioning some of the, the tools and techniques that are used to assess things like color contrast mm. and, and typography and things like that. Mm. Are there ways that those things can be pushed even further? That's really interesting. Um, I, I imagine for that team as well, a, a big thing that we're hearing this year, which we imagine the next five years is going to get extrapolate more, is incorporating sustainability in web yeah, design sure. in the sense of, oh, let's try and not use bloated yeah. code and uh, let's make sure we're only using images that have been compressed and yep. uh, maybe even looking at, like, should we need that auto-playing, you know, GIF of sure. the drone footage over the institution? Yep. Has that come into any of the thinking for digital yep. presence? So that's actually embedded in the digital presence strategy was uh, a notion that we would try and reduce the carbon footprint of our digital presence. And rationalizing the sites that we've got and the architecture that they run on is, mm. is part of that. 
um, which is great as far as I'm concerned. Things like an approach to reducing carbon footprints of digital environments or mm. presences, as well as improving accessibility. I just think it's sort of it's in both cases for me, it's a no brainer because you improve the experience for everybody, mm. but you also make it easier to run. So, yeah, we're very much up for that. And I imagine that helps with buy-in at a higher level across the institution. I imagine that's tied to a bigger strategic initiative of the institution to be sustainable yeah, by sure. X percent. And you I mean, try and quantify that potentially. Yeah, so that's a really good point. I mean, the whole quantifying thing is where we're still finding all the data sources that we've got access to that we can kind of report mm. on to show people what the current picture is like. So we think we have 3,200 websites. There may be even more than that where mm. institutions have maybe bought domains outside of CAMAC UK, for example. Yeah. So even trying to benchmark where we currently are, sorry, baseline where we currently are, has been a relatively new activity that Digital Presence has started up. Mm. So yes, of course, we want to reduce the carbon footprint of our digital presence. And we've got programs like Cambridge Zero, which is bringing all of our climate related science from across the institution together mm. to look at solving some of those issues for the world, essentially. Um, they have a web presence as well. So we're thinking about how we could even experiment with the way that they're mm. presented online to reduce their carbon footprint. Um, people will buy into it, but we need to be able to show them what's the size of our current carbon footprint. Well, we need right, to know yeah, how many websites yeah. we've got before <laughs> we can start measuring that. Uh, that kind of ties into, you You mentioned, well, there it's like, well, we need quantifiable numbers for our data. Like, I guess the importance of data for this project is, you know, how you're gathering it, the management of it. And you talked about we're trying to be as evidence-based. Sure. Can you maybe dive into that a little bit more about how that impacts the decisions you make and you make the best use of your time? Yeah, of course. I mean, many of the committees that we report to with the program to talk about progress and where we're heading and whether mm. the scope is increasing or narrowing or whatever it might be, we might go to that committee, but there might be somebody that goes to that committee after us who wants to get a new... Um, scanner for a hospital mm. or they want maybe they want to create a new laboratory for studying plants or something like that yeah or they might be trying to pitch a whole new course for students whatever it might be so we're arriving at a committee that is looking at lots of very important issues and for some of those committee members we might just be coming with an IT problem Mm. And they think, well, with most IT problems, you just buy the solution from the market and yeah. it's fixed. And so we're trying to bring the institution up to the idea, and they are getting there now, that it's not really IT, it's digital. And digital doesn't just mean software, it means people and messaging and behavior yeah. and all those sorts of things. So... So you, well, I was going to say that's tied. So when you are going to those committee, you need yes. to have a strong reasoning behind. Yes. The, so so we have to be prepared to go to a committee that is looking at very black and white business cases that say if we buy this particular piece of laboratory equipment, mm. we can accelerate research into this particular discipline. Right. Yeah. At, at this speed. Yeah. And so we're going in and saying we want to make websites look better and work better. And they'll say, well, give me a number. How bad are they at the moment? Yeah. And how can you improve that number over the next few years? And so sometimes we're conflicted because we have to sort of say, well, we're taking a user-centered approach to this. Mm. So we have to understand what the user experience is of interacting with our websites at the moment and how we can improve that iteratively. And it's difficult to put a deadline on that because we don't know until we start digging how many problems we're going to find. Yeah. And that challenge of quantifying the value of user experience as well. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, one of the things we can do with that is sort of show drop off rates for people trying to work through our websites. Or, for example, you know, often people will say, how many page views have we had on our web story or our web page this month? And we're trying to be a bit smarter about that. So we can say, well, this story has had 20,000 people have looked at it. Mm. But it's 
4,000 words long and the average view duration is about five seconds. So you need to be able to kind of really quantify that engagement. Yeah. Is that a worthwhile engagement or not? So we're trying to be a bit more brutal about reporting on statistics so that we can say, we need to know what you're trying to, what do you consider a success? Somebody reading that entire article or just somebody just clicking on the link? Yeah, I guess there's a big difference between vanity metrics with yeah. views and understanding the right person read the right piece of content exactly. and trying to figure out yeah. how we can manipulate data and reporting so that yeah. you can have some sort of understanding that, yeah, this got to the right audience exactly. and they're the ones that engage with it and then we can follow their, their journey on from there. I suppose we've dived into quite deep there. Where are you in the journey at the moment? Like what, what, what phase and uh, what's still to come? I'd say we're probably about halfway through in that we, we really understand the size of the problem now. And now we're kind of going back to the institution and saying, like, well, now we really get it. And we've got mm. a suite of directions we could go in to deliver a number of different approaches to this. And it's a case of we need to be steered by what the institution's priorities might be mm. before we commit to the second half of the program, really. Okay. I mean, it won't be possible to deliver everything that we would wanted to have delivered by the end of the five year period. Um, but we'll certainly be able to show what best practice looks like and have enough of a model with enough kind of live examples that mm. we can then start, you know, iterating that and launching it across all of our different sites. So that's interesting. You said five years. Um, now, uh, I guess that ties into the fact that you've got all got day jobs you've got to continue with at the yeah, same time. Absolutely. So that's why. It, was there a bit of sort of raised eyebrows when you went to the committee that this is a five year engagement or is that fairly standard for Cambridge that these things take that long? I think for this program, this is the most ambi ambitious digital program the university's ever really engaged with that's looking at websites. Yeah. And by showing them similar programs that we'd run in the past, the kind of funding that went into those and the number of people that went into them and what came out the other end, it did scale, I think, respectfully. The five year period of time did make sense. Mm. And we did we gave them a roadmap at, at the beginning showing the sorts of things that we could do each year. Mm. A few little things came along, like the pandemic, that <laughs> we weren't really expecting. <laughs> uh, and the other thing, of course, was that We've got dedicated members of staff that the program have paid for, but then also we rely on availability of other areas of expertise within the university, and they also have a, other work to do. Mm. And so we're trying to be pragmatic and sensible, which we are being with, with how the money is spent and yeah. how the best use of time for the people that, that we do have. Mm. You mentioned you're halfway. Have there been some things that you can sort of say, oh yeah, this is this is because of the digital presence project, are there many outcomes or results that you'd like to share with the audience? Yeah, I think, well, firstly, an acknowledgement that publishing by default isn't necessarily a solution for everything. And just mm. the idea that if you take those 2.1 million web pages, there's a very compelling argument that maybe 50% of that doesn't even need to exist anymore. And then of that subset, maybe 50% could sensibly be on an intranet. Yeah. And people understand that now. So that's been a real, real success mm. um, because we have to build that solution now. Yeah. So the, the appetite is there. Yeah. And I suppose attached to that, we're in a situation now where there are many institutions out there within the university that are waiting and happy to have a centrally provided solution that they can, mm. they can be part of. And certainly when I started the university, I don't think that would have been the case. So I think we've been able to show that there's a central pocket of expertise that can be trusted mm. and it's just a case of giving us the time and the space to to create that solution in a weird way you've done the hard part yeah the, the people so. part you know the behavior yeah. the willingness and the the technology sector section you know enabling somewhat non-technical users to you know when it's the right use case and they you know could just be an event or a micro landing page to do that and giving them the tools to do it, then, um, then it's just technology and you know picking the right tooling and that is it really. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I think a lot of people are finding it hard to hire staff at the moment across the country. Yeah, it's a so, skills gap, isn't there? Exactly. Yeah. So we do. There, there's a there's a portion of that. So if anybody watching this is you know 
keep an eye on jobs.cam.ac. There we go, you heard that. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've got lots of very interesting vacancies at the moment, not just in the IT side of things, but across the university. And it's a very exciting place to work. And, and I, as I say, I've nearly been here for 15 years, and that's because the job has been very varied. And I've been able to, you know, I've been lucky to work with lots of people from across the university. Yeah. So it's, it's a good place to be. So halfway through, um, is there anything that you would have done differently? Yes, I would have asked for more money at the beginning, I think. <laughs> um, it's very difficult to tell how much these things are going to cost when actually probably would have made more sense to just get budget for the research and scoping area, bit of it, and then and then repitch for budget for the delivery point. Yeah. Um, and the university were being very responsible with the way that they're using their money. And we had a fixed pot for the whole whole program, really. So I think we could have been a bit more savvy about how we did that to make sure that we didn't do which we did do, which was, I suppose I wouldn't have done this differently, be very ambitious about what we're trying to achieve. Yeah. But maybe be more pragmatic about at what point in that journey we would be able to come back with answers as to what we can actually deliver or what the best solution is, mm. you know. Yeah, so what's something that seems wrapped up in time, when you actually dive into it, all of these other requirements comes, you know, come up to the surface. Exactly. That you're never going to know before you start getting going, yeah. isn't it? We did, I mean, we made our, our decisions at the beginning based on the data that we had available to us at the time. Yeah. And we created and found a lot more data during those first couple of years. Mm. And that has all been able to inform, you know, a much more kind of robust picture of what we can do and what's, what the real problems are. Mm. So I think we did the best we could at the time. And it's easy to, to say, well, let's go travel back in time with all the data we've got now <laughs> and do it again. Mm. So let's finally then talk on the a touch on sort of inclusivity. Now, mm. I know that this initiative is probably it's probably embedded into what you're doing for digital presence, but it's probably working in parallel as well. Sure. Um, and maybe if we start talking about this in the sense of the application process and how Cambridge wants to potentially change who is it that applies to the institution, because it's, it's obviously understandable for the audience that you have no shortage of applicants. You probably have you know, a, an acceptance rate in the single digits percentage points. Um, but you're, you and your department are looking at that to try and to alter it, could you explain? Yeah, um, well, ever since I've been at the university, starting in 2008, there's been a push to change perceptions of, of the university and making sure that, as I say, the brightest students out there feel that they're the right ones to apply mm. to study here. That, that's always been the case, and we have widening participation teams. And each of the 31 colleges has staff that physically go around the country visiting different schools to present mm. what the opportunities are at the university. And for us, through the digital side of things, we're just trying to emphasize the fact, again, as I said earlier, that if a sixth former's first experience of the university is our current websites, mm. this is what happens to that sixth former if they click through what we currently present them with. Yeah, And so, the, the ambitions of the departments might already be there and, and everybody at the university really is in agreement that we need to mm. have our doors open for the, the best students that are out there. Mm. But we're not at the moment reflecting that ethos through the way that we do things online. And we've mm. been able to show that a lot more compellingly, I think, through the programme. Do you think there are perceptions of Cambridge that are sort of it's unobtainable for me that have negatively impacted people to apply? For some, for some students, for sure, and that can be for any manner of reasons. It might be that a student's perception might be influenced by things that their parents or guardians might say. It might be that they have a careers advisor at a school that might say to them, it's not the right university for you. Mm. It might be that the student may read about the university through the press. Um, the press may in sometimes be interested in what our students do because of the kind of history of the place. It's, mm. You can create a story. And so 
I think that we own the content on our own website. So really, it is within our gift to optimize that experience for our mm. web users as much as possible. And to not do that seems to be missing a trick. I think we've been very effective at showing a different side of the university through social media. Mm. Because we were able to create a presence on things like Instagram and Twitter and Facebook, mm. where we hadn't had a presence before. So in a way, we were starting from scratch. And with many of those accounts, when they first got created, the users of those, in some cases, there were six formers, were saying, I can't believe the university's got an account on Instagram. And, and now uh, Amy Mollett, who heads up our social media and, mm. and AV team, uh, has been doing amazing stuff with TikTok. I mean, the University of Cambridge has got an incredible TikTok account now. And we see some great engagement through that. So, yeah, it's possible to open the doors. Yeah. But with our websites, it's still got a, a way to go. Uh, so it sounds like there was a bit of maybe sniffiness from people about like, oh, how could our brand be taken to these new platforms there, maybe? Um. I think I think there was an assumption that that would be the case. But when push came to shove, people were very up for it within the university. And I think one of the things was switching the idea from the comms office that if the university is a kind of collection of academics and professional staff from lots of different areas of the world, all looking at different subject areas and all going off on their own mm. tangent, really experimenting with communications and engagement through digital platforms is just another kind of academic experiment to a certain extent. Yeah, I suppose so. And so if we were able to say we're experimenting with this medium and we're going to record to see what happens, that there was, they were up for it. That's in the ethos of the institution. Okay. Yeah, very much so. Do you do you feel responsible for the university's brand when you're running comms and running digital <laughs> as head of digital? Everybody in the university is kind of in charge of it in to a certain extent. I mean, anybody that writes a, an email or mm. creates a poster or, or gives a lecture or runs an event or maybe you know they might be in a cafe and somebody might say. Oh, my kid's interested in studying at Cambridge. Mm. You know, that member of staff or the academic might say, well, they might want to go to this route or have they thought about doing this? It's, it's all connected, really. It's difficult with an institution like that that's been around for over 800 years mm. to be able to put the management reputation in one particular spot. Yes, yeah, so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's a great answer. Right. Thanks so much for your time. That was a great conversation and uh, thanks again. Cheers, well. <laughs>